The website is down. They don't answer the phones. Rough rollout. The vaccine is here, but getting a shot is very hard. We know that there's great demand and we want to greet that demand, but unfortunately we will not be able to provide any new appointments. Camping out for vaccine. Seniors wait all night to get a shot. I mean, I'm not scared of it. I feel like everybody who comes here is not scared of it or else you shouldn't be coming here. New Year's visitors. They came, they saw, they partied without masks. We've never lost an election. We're winning this election. Alternative facts reach a sell-by date. The roundtable has it covered. A big holiday week in the news, all on This Week in South Florida. Good morning. Glad you could join us. I'm Michael Putney. Glenna is off today. Have you been able to get vaccinated to get your shot? If so, you are one of the lucky ones and also one of the older ones, 65 or above, or a medical professional. The governor made seniors his top COVID priority after those frontline medical workers, but tens of thousands of seniors are still waiting for their shots, along with millions of younger Floridians. It's going to be months before many of them do get vaccinated. The vaccine rollout has been rocky. Less than a quarter of the more than one million doses sent to Florida have been administered. So what is the holdup here? Why has the vaccine rollout been so chaotic, so disorganized? The state agency in charge of the rollout is the Division of Emergency Services. Its director is Jared Moskowitz, a former state representative from Coral Springs, joins us now via Skype from Parkland. Jared, good morning. Thanks for uh, being with us. Good morning, Michael. Thank you. Great to have you. Uh, Jared, very simply, why has the vaccine rollout been so rocky? Well, I mean, look, there's a couple of reasons why the start has been, you know, slightly mediocre. You know, one is obviously we, there's not great visibility on uh, when, you know, the the week by week delivery schedules uh, in the Tiberius system that the federal government gives you. So it's tough to do long range planning when you're only getting a seven day, uh, you know, look and when the vaccine is coming. Also, there's a lot of hesitancy, unfortunately, with a lot of providers on the second shot, because, again, we don't have a really good look on when that second shot is coming, even though the first delivery of the second shot did arrive, a lot of providers are hesitant uh, to get that vaccine on the street, but we're working with them. This is a decentralized effort. It's part of the, the mass vaccination plan, not just here in the state of Florida, but around the nation. Healthcare is delivered at the local level. So you're talking about hospitals, county health departments, pharmacies, you're talking about thousands of different providers. It's not, healthcare is not delivered at the state level. So this vaccine yeah. is gonna be done with folks on the ground at the local level. So look, our job at the division is to assess what plans have gone well and what plans have not gone well. You know, clearly yeah. making people wait in line is not a good plan. So look, the division is gonna be standing up this week uh, to be taking an extremely much more active role with the governor's direction to assist these county health departments, uh, to assist the hospitals uh, where they need it. Yeah, well, we understand there are a lot of moving parts. It's a huge, complex process to get millions of shots out to the hospitals, to the medical people, and to get the shots into the arms of people. But, you know, the question, Jared, I keep hearing over and over emails, people who stop me at the supermarket, I still go to the supermarket, uh, is, you know, when and how do I get a shot? I just don't know. Nobody is telling me. So w when you hear that question, what do you, what do you say? Well, Michael, uh, you know, when you go to the supermarket, obviously, thank you for wearing a, a mask. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, look, what we say to people right now is, and what Dr. Fauci has said is that this is going to take a long period of time. It's going to take a year uh, to, to really get to that community immunity. You know, the governor has prioritized folks in our long-term care facilities since day one, so that continues to be the mission. The federal pharmacy program, you know, has not been going at the speed that we would like. Uh, so, you know, the division will be assisting uh, where we can. You know, obviously turning on the 65 and older program, you know, which was slightly different what the CDC recommended. Uh, obviously we did uh, long-term care facilities. We started with that and we started with hospital workers like the CDC recommended. So that really was the first week. Remember, we're only in the third week uh, of the roll-up so far. We've done about 250,000 uh, shots in arms uh, to date. Uh, but, you know, with 65 and older being one of the first states to turn that on because the governor wants to make sure the people who are most susceptible, most likely to wind up in the hospital, most likely to tax the healthcare system. Obviously, we have 4 million Floridians that fit into that category, and we don't have enough vaccines. So there is a supply and demand issue. 
But yeah. look, when you're dealing with 67 different county health departments and 300 hospitals, you're dealing with different reservation systems, different leaders, different instructions, different interpretations. So it isn't like testing or PPE, which was a completely state-led mission. And so, you know, there's going to be varying degrees. People, look, I, I know asking them to be patient when we see the light at the end of the tunnel, but look, it's going to get better every single solitary day. We're helping to build a, a vaccination army, if you will, uh, here at the division that will help deploy out uh, at the local level because we really want to get that throughput up, uh, you know, to make sure we're doing more shots uh, per day. Yeah, well, we know and have reported, of course, that I guess last week, uh, you, the governor, designated Broward and Pinellas County long-term care facilities to have strike teams go out and deliver, uh, administer the vaccine, uh, and that's great. Uh, but what about, I mean, Florida has, what, close to 500,000 people in various long-term care facilities around the state. When are they going to get the vaccine? Yeah, Michael, so there's 4,000 long-term care facilities, and we know that because the division went into all of them and tested everybody. We tested 1.5 million people on those facilities within 90 days. So right now, you know, the federal pharmacy program, the federal government is the one handling those long-term care facilities. The governor wanted us to do Broward and Pinellas because he wanted us to get ahead of the federal pharmacy program and see how it how it goes. You know, so far, it's not going at the speed that, that we would like. And so I think you're going to see the division uh, you know, try to assist the federal pharmacy program uh, to go around the state to go into those facilities. We were able to do all the facilities, the skilled nursing facilities in both Broward and Pinellas County in five days. And so, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, the federal pharmacy program should be able to give everyone the first shot, in my opinion, in, in three weeks. And it doesn't seem to be that that is going at the speed. We're not a party to that contract. So unfortunately, the, the sharing of the information is not what we would like. Uh, so the state's going to be examining the feasibility to, to assist the federal pharmacy partners in getting more uh, shots and arms in the long-term care facilities, because there's no doubt that we must, we must uh, get into those facilities uh, in the coming days and in the coming weeks. Yeah. That's got to be the priority. We've, we've, we've talked to the partners about that. We've made sure that they understand the importance of it. But look, if they don't perform, then you know we'll wind up doing it for them. Right. Uh, Jared, tell us about the future supply of vaccine. As you say, it's a supply and demand <clears throat> problem. The federal government sends the state the vaccines. Now, what what are you scheduled to get? What numbers do you expect of both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine in the, say, the next week or so? Right. So, look, we got 250,000 doses last week. I expect a similar amount of doses uh, this week. Uh, and then I don't know anything else. And, and so that is kind of what the problem is with, uh, with the system at the moment is it's tough to you know, people keep asking me, you know, what am I going to get in two weeks? What am I getting in three weeks? And the truth is, I don't even know what the state is going to receive. And so we have to allocate this on a week to week basis. We can't allocate it with, you know, future long term planning uh, because it's just not available in Tiberius. And like I said before, the second shot, uh, we know when we know about a week before when that second shot is going right. to come. And it did come for the Pfizer five. So that's obviously good news. But again, tough to do planning because everyone wants to know when it's arriving and we can't tell them because the federal government system doesn't give us that visibility. There are going to be pods opening up all over the state and just, you know, in South Florida, 10 pods are going to be opening in Broward, three in Dade, three in Palm Beach, you know, in the next week or so. The state's going to be, you know, looking at all of our testing sites and converting a bunch of those uh, into vaccine sites. And so uh, more and more will pop up. But at the end of the day, our throughput will be impacted by a couple of things. One will be how much vaccine we receive and obviously how many people we have uh, you know, doing shots and arms. Uh, what we can do here at the state is we can increase the throughput by putting more people on the street to do shots. Obviously, we cannot increase the amount of vaccine that's up to the federal government. Right. Well, we know you are doing your best. We hope uh, and are looking for assurances that this rollout is going to smooth out a little bit. Is it going to sort of get better as we go along here, say the next week or so, do you think? Yeah, Michael, listen, it's going to get better. Just like when testing first started, uh, the division had to go out and procure COVID test kits on the, on, on the private market because none were available. Then there were no swabs available. We had to go procure that. Uh, you know, then there was, you know, we had PPE issues. Obviously, we had to go do that. We got 80 million masks out, 15 million in our long-term care facility. So, Every time there's kind of like a new facet since, you know, the states are pretty much on their own, we have to go out, uh, work with our local partners and do it on our own. And sometimes, it, you know, you hit a couple bumps 
uh, you know, some growing pains as you start something new. Uh, and so w this, w this will smooth itself out. You know, look, I'm as frustrated as everybody else. You know, I want to get to the end of this nightmare as well, uh, you know, to get back to all of our lives, let the economy flourish. You know, there's people's lives that are on the line. There are people who are in hospitals still suffering from COVID-19. Uh, you know, there, there are folks out there that, you know, even though the vaccine's available, it's a bittersweet moment. They've lost loved ones. So that's yeah. not lost on me. Uh, that this is extremely important and that we that everybody needs to do a better job, everybody involved in getting that vaccine out. You know, not just us at, in my division, but obviously the folks at the local level, uh, the ones, you know, actually putting shots in arms. So yeah. it's going to get better. Uh, you know, everyone wants to get to the end of this. And I know that's kind of what some of the anxiety is. It's, it's finally here and everyone wants a shot. But look, even Dr. Fauci said this is going to take a long period of time. And so uh, this will get smoother, you know, shortly. We hope you're right, and we are counting on you and your staff to uh, help make it right. Jared Moskowitz, always good to speak with you. Thanks for your time this morning. You got it, Michael. We'll be there for Floridians. I know you will. Thanks. All right, up next, we're going to speak to the doctor in charge of COVID at Holy Cross in Fort Lauderdale. When the first shipments of the vaccine arrived in Florida in mid-December, it went to five major hospitals across the state. The next shipment went to other hospitals, including Holy Cross in Fort Lauderdale. The interim chief medical officer there is Dr. Eduardo Locatelli. He is also the incident commander for COVID response at Holy Cross, and he joins us live now by way of Skype. Dr. Locatelli, good morning. Thanks for being with us. Uh, good morning, Michael. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So uh, first, let me begin. I assume, shouldn't assume anything, but that uh, that you and all the other frontline medical personnel at Holy Cross, you have received your vaccine, your shot. Yes, I, I have. And um, most of the everybody that wants it, there's still some uh, some people are thinking about it, but the majority of them have received the first dose. Yeah. You know, uh, that raises a good question. It seems inconceivable, frankly, to me that somebody in the medical profession who sees patients dying, struggling with this awful virus, would refuse to take the shot. Why do medical workers, some, uh, say that they don't want to take a shot? Uh, there's a, a slight um, tilt towards women and reproductive age. They have concerns of the long term. We have no data to support that belief, but they're you know, this is not yet a mandatory vaccination, so they uh, want to see a little bit more data coming through. I don't, I don't think we will have that kind of data, but it's mostly women in reproductive age that the ones you are thinking about it. Yeah, I see. Uh, Dr. Locatelli, uh, tell us about citizens who live in Fort Lauderdale or anywhere in Broward who would like to come and get a shot at Holy Cross. Are you vaccinating people, citizens 65 and older? Uh, we haven't yet. Uh, we'll start that uh, somewhat meet up next uh, this coming week. Um, we have done big efforts through the emergency room and through another site, Neuroscience Institute. Uh, but the facilities were a little complicated in terms of the throughput there. But on Tuesday, uh, we're going to open a new vaccination center. It's a different facility. We have uh, renovated and made adjustments to make it a, a specific site for vaccination. Uh, we think we're going to move over a thousand people and they allow me over nine, maybe even 2000 people a day. And at that point, we'll be able to do uh, 65 and older uh, with no problems. Right. And you have the staff already on hand who can administer, dispense the shots? Uh, you, you asked the question that is really the challenge. Uh, we have what we need for the beginning. Uh, we started a process on volunteers and new hires to create a center that will uh, will be vaccinated for many months to come. So we are preparing for the beginning and we're going to be increasing the throughput in the next few days. So uh, we'll be ready for sure in the next few days. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Locatelli, um, I'm, obviously I have no particular medical knowledge. I have degrees in literature and not in medicine, but it, it's pretty clear from what I have read and conversations with doctors that you in the medical profession have made huge strides in learning how to treat uh, COVID-19. The death rates, in fact, uh, have been going down in the state. Tell us what you have learned and, and why you are better now 
at treating this terrible disease? So first of all, we are much more uh, quickly to diagnose uh, those even they're asymptomatic because sometimes they quickly change the status within a few hours. So diagnosis better and understanding the different uh, phases of this condition. Uh, second, we have some tools now. Uh, we use the uh, convalescent plasma, and then we move into the uh, monoclonal antibodies that we give right at the beginning and then uh, prevent even the admissions. And then we have some antivirals, uh, including rendazivir and the use of steroids. But particularly the doctors now have uh, accumulated a wealth of experience. We know how to, at the beginning, we're given too much ventilation. We're doing a little bit less now than before. <clears throat> And the management of nurses and physicians is they have learned so much, they have an expertise over a short period of time that are allowing us to really save many more lives as compared to the beginning. Yeah. Uh, doctor, as the chief medical officer there at Holy Cross, and just for the record, I had a surgery there in July, a shoulder surgery, did great at Holy Cross, so thank you very much to the You're hospital welcome. and your staff. Um, I don't know that you've been able to see this, However, over the New Year's holiday, uh, local 10 News, other media uh, have shown pictures of hundreds, you know, dozens of people jammed into bars and restaurants, you know, at clubs in Fort Lauderdale, Delray Beach, South Beach, um, and people partying like, you know, it was 2019 instead of 2020 and not wearing masks, not social distancing, when you see those pictures, what, what would you say to those people? Well, even if I rephrase regarding vaccination, so the, after the first dose, there's no protection. The second dose, there's no protection some two weeks later. So even if you get a vaccine, you need about you know five to six weeks to have protection. So right now, vaccination, even those may be at the bar, they think they are protected because they got a dose of vaccine, they are not protected at all. But then definitely, uh, I think what we see is the fatigue that everybody has, you know, because we are already going into one year of this uh, and people are very fatigued. But I really, I think uh, if you look at the numbers, it's more important today to stay protected than it was even in March. Uh, we have the new strain is here already from the UK, is in Florida. It's gonna be more contagious than th we have before. So the numbers are really very high right now and people should take a completely different approach to this socially. Uh, I think this is uh, fairly unacceptable uh, to have such a crowds there. It's, um, it's gonna cause a lot of trouble coming soon. Yeah, you know, uh, I looked at the latest figures from the State Department of Health and I think that uh, uh, in Broward County, there are roughly nearly 600 people hospitalized at various facilities uh, for COVID-19 uh, today, uh, over a thousand in Miami-Dade. Uh, how many ICU beds do you have? I mean, if there were a surge, would you be able to accommodate uh, people who need treatment? Yes, we, we have uh, a capacity in terms of both uh, uh, rooms available, and ventilators available. Uh, I don't think that's gonna be a limitation in our facility. Uh, we, we can triple what we have now in terms of volume. So uh, we've been blessed, I think, in, in, in Broward um, because the cases uh, are compared to other centers and other parts of the country, we're still not overwhelmed. But obviously the number keep going this way. There's no enough bed anywhere to, to do that. Our limitations particularly will be in personnel, as you mentioned before. They are not gonna be ICU beds and they are not gonna be ventilators. It's gonna be personnel. Yeah. Dr. Eduardo Locatelli, very good to speak with you this morning. Thank you, and thanks to, you know, the medical staff at uh, Holy Cross for doing a good job. And I'm sure when you start giving out uh, shots to the public, uh, I guess this coming week, uh, you're going to be very, very busy. We will. We we'll continue, but we're happy to do so. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank, thank you very much. All right. Up next, uh, going hungry in the land of plenty. Farm Share is dedicated to seeing that that does not happen. We're going to talk to their leader after the break. The pandemic has exacerbated an existing food crisis in South Florida, where one in five kids 
go to bed hungry at night, according to the census. The politically correct word for that is food insecurity, which I find a gauzy term for a hard and terrible problem. Fortunately, FarmShare is here to help. It's a nonprofit based in Homestead that has been packing up fresh fruits and vegetables since 1991 and giving them out free to families, homeless shelters, soup kitchens, food banks, a lot of people. It's a big operation. It has distributed 97 million pounds of food since the pandemic began. The farm share motto is no person goes hungry, no food goes to waste. The CEO of FarmShare is Steve Shelley, who also happens to be the mayor of Homestead and joins us live now via Skype. Mayor Shelley, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having us. So how are things going with FarmShare? The demand for your food, your products, I'm sure, has never been higher. Uh, how yeah. is the demand? It is, it's going up. And so we reached a peak, you know, during the original first peak of the pandemic between, say, May and July. You know, it was a, we had 200 percent more output than we had normally had. It was probably a five or six fold increase. It leveled off as things started to open back up and some of the shut in orders started to go down. But now as the case counts are skyrocketing again, and as you have people trying to stay home, especially those who are higher at risk, you see the demand also going back up again. It started to climb starting November. Uh, and it's continuing to climb as we go forward. And the worst part about it is our food supply is also starting to decline at a time when the demand is going up and, and becoming higher than it has been in more than six months. Yeah, why is the food supply declining? I mean, the huge ag industry in South Dade is the main contributor, generously gives farm share, a, you know, a lot, a lot of food, tons of food, why are they? Why is the supply decreasing? And so, FarmShare uh, gets a lot of its produce, you know, from our local farmers. And in fact, last year it was more than 30 million pounds of local, healthy, nutritious produce. But in addition to that produce, FarmShare also uh, moves a lot more of non-perishable food products and protein, which is important to make sure that everybody has a balanced meal. And so, one of the issues with COVID is it's it's disrupted the produce supply chain. And so, these farmers, you know, don't know whether or not they're going to be able to move their product because Cruise lines are shut down, uh, major venues are shut down, restaurants aren't doing as much food products as they used to do. And so the farmers are hesitant. They got stuck with a lot of product in the spring that they couldn't move and ultimately took huge losses. And so they've grown less this year than they have in years past, leaving less excess to be donated to organizations like FarmShare for distribution purposes. And then in addition, you also have the federal government cutting back on some additional programs, the Farmers and Family Food Box program. Uh, was great for the farmers. It was also great for the food banks. Uh, and that came to an end uh, a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, Steve, ex explain to us about your finances. I mean, clearly, you've got five big warehouses. You've got trucks. You've got people who do this work. A lot of them are volunteers. Sort of go through the process. How does, how does this work and who pays for it? Correct. And so it costs money to acquire, store and redistribute this food product across the entire state of Florida uh, to millions of people who, who are hungry and, and distribute millions of meals every single year. And ultimately, a lot of that's funded by the state of Florida. Uh, the state of Florida is one of the biggest supporters of and funders uh, and providing resources to farm share to make sure that we can carry out our mission. And this particular year, we, we, we know the state of Florida is potentially facing a five billion shortfall. Right. Uh, in addition to approximately the two billion shortfall they, they occur and currently are occurring this particular fiscal year. And so that gives us real concern about whether or not there is going to be funding available uh, to provide to food banks like FarmShare to make sure that we can continue to carry out our mission, especially now when COVID has had such a big impact on the economy. And you already have 3.5 million people who are food insecure in the state before COVID hit. And now that number is exponentially increasing. And so there's real concerns about how food banks like FarmShare are going to be able to continue operating as we move forward into a very uncertain year. Yeah, uh, well said. Well, I, I think I did see the other day that state economists looking at prospective revenue think that maybe the revenue is not going to be quite as grim as they had thought for the state of Florida. Nevertheless, uh, maybe uh, all of us who support your work uh, could uh, talk to our state senator, our state representative, yes. and say, hey, make sure that you fund farm share. Wouldn't be a bad thing, would it? <laughs> no, that wouldn't be bad at all. We can use all the help we can get. I mean, make your phone calls to, to let them know this is an important issue to you to make sure that it gets funded. And also call your, your congressional reps. 
your federal yeah. reps, because one of the biggest hopes is, is that the federal government will provide some additional funding to state and county governments to make up for some of the expenses that they've incurred to respond to COVID. And then they can turn around and pass some of those dollars back down to local food bank programs like FarmShare. Yeah, yeah, well said. Steve, I remember uh, years ago, Patricia Robbins, who began FarmShare, was a, uh, a guest on this program. It was a proud moment, uh, admired the work that she was doing, admired the work that you were doing at FarmShare. Thanks for your time this morning. We wish you the best. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us and bringing light to this issue. All right, good. All right, up next, a special edition of the Roundtable. We are going to look back some of the major events of 2020 and look forward to what may be coming in 2021. Well, on this Sunday, we have got a very special roundtable for you today. Two of South Florida's best journalists and opinion leaders are with us to look back at 2020 and look forward to 2021. Nancy Ancrum is there. There she is, top of your screen on the left, editorial page editor of the Miami Herald. And there below is uh, our friend Rosemary O'Hara, editorial page editor of the Sun Sentinel. Ladies, good morning or good afternoon. Great to have you with us. Happy New Year. Well, happy, happy New Year to you both. Uh, we're going to look back, as I said, at some of the key events of 2020. And there's no question, Nancy and Rosemary, the big story of the year is COVID-19. Changed the way we work, the way we worship, the way we amuse ourselves, you know, and underscored some of the disparities uh, in American life between haves and have-nots. I mean, uh, Rosemary, there just hasn't ever been a year like this in our lifetime. No, I was just thinking back to the last time that I was in the studio on the round table yeah. and what a big deal it was for us to bump elbows and how long it's been and, and you know how, how our lives have so changed, hunkered down um, in, a, in, in a way that, that nothing has ever happened like this to us in our lifetimes. And yet we're fortunate enough to be still talking to one another, being healthy, when so many of our neighbors and friends and family are, um, you know, some of them are not here anymore, sadly, and too many of them are infected. And it's just so discouraging to know that our country has the worst rate of COVID in the world by far. It has been so mishandled at, you know, at every step of the way. But, you know, we did end the year on a positive note with the, with the arrival of uh, these vaccines. Now let's just hope that people can quickly and orderly get that shot in the arm. Right. Uh, Nancy Ancrum, you had, I thought, an excellent editorial Friday in the Herald where you said at the end of this awful year, uh, we, it's a bittersweet time, but we can reassess, we can begin again, we can be hopeful. Um, it's hard, but we can, can't we? Absolutely. Um, you know, Rosemary is right. There, you know, I would say the majority of us made it. We made it through the end of the year. Uh, we, it was a slog for so many, and it was a major slog for people who were charged with keeping our lives going, whether it was from delivering groceries or your Amazon packages, um, drivers, grocery checkouts, essential workers, and of course, our first line healthcare workers and first responders. And yes, the vaccine does bring so much hope. However, however, the rollout, not just in this state, but across the country, has just added insult to the significant injury yeah. that's been done by its being mishandled. Once again, responsibility for distributing um, the vaccination and th the vaccine and getting people actually vaccinated falls to the locals yep. here and across the country. And of course, every municipality, every county has different rules. So it, it, uh, no one should be shocked, but it is a surprise that our state government has not learned or does not want to learn 
from the mishandling of the original crisis. Yeah, Rosemary, weigh in on that because uh, we know today that uh, the state of Florida has received about 1.2 million doses of vaccine and 250,000 people have been vaccinated in the course of three weeks. I mean, that's really a pathetic kind of showing, a, a pathetic response, isn't it? You know, to, yes, to Nancy's point, you know, the it comes down to health departments to um, administer this vaccine to the general population 65 plus. And Florida has starved its county health departments for years. Um, and now for the most important um, D-Day of our generation, you know, we're leaving it to this underfunded, undermanned, undertrained um, organization. The other, the other people that need to be called out here, though, too, are CVS and Walgreens, which are supposed to be organizing the delivery of vaccines in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. And just today, I'm hearing from. Uh, family members of, in some of these homes where the virus is still running rampant, they still don't, so while the, the general population over 65 can now hopefully sign up to get the, the vaccine, in some of these long-term care centers, they still don't know when their loved one will be able to get vaccine, even as the virus continues its march. So I think CVS and Walgreens needs to come out and say, when are you going to vaccinate these these vulnerable people in older home centers? And also state government needs to tell us too, why are we vaccinating 65 plus before we finish vaccinating the people in long-term care centers? Right. You know, on Tuesday of this week, we saw something I, I was just unbelievable over in Fort Myers on the other side of the state in Lee County, there were hundreds of seniors who spent the night sitting outside lawn chairs and under blankets um, waiting to get a shot because the Lee County Health Department said, well, we'll start giving uh, vaccine uh, vaccinations uh, tomorrow, first come, first serve. I mean, good Lord, what what is going on in a state where elderly people are spending the night uh, waiting to get something. I mean, this is just not the way to roll out a vaccination program. Absolutely. And, you know, this is the, this, I think, if we want to look at it from the top down, this is the result of President Trump's administration dismantling the, the pandemic fa uh, task force, ripping up the 68-page, um, uh, you know, specific plan on how to handle just such a scourge as the coronavirus and winging it yeah. and rejecting science. And that, that lack of respect for planning, uh, the lack of organization has just rolled downhill to affect all of the locals, all of the local municipalities that are, again, doing it their own way and not necessarily right. doing it the best way. Yeah, well, we both know, and in fact, uh, your pages, your newspapers have both editorialized about this. Uh, South Florida mayors and the biggest cities, Broward County, Miami Beach, uh, City of Miami, Hialeah, and elsewhere, uh, have all asked the governor, after he issued an executive order September 25th, saying that they could not collect fines, they really couldn't enforce any of their tougher restrictions. But Rosemary, the, the governor just isn't budging. You know, he is saying, no, we're not going to shut down. You can't collect fines. And the result is what we saw over the last couple of days is thousands of people going out and partying close to each other. They're not wearing masks. They're not taking any precautions. There are 12 governors in this country ha who have refused to um, issue a statewide mask ordinance or requirements that you socially distance when you're in public. But only one governor, had, including Governor DeSantis, and he stands alone in he's the only governor in the country who refuses to let 
cities and counties enforce local mask orders. So at a time when he is saying the state knows best and, you know, the economy is more important than trying to prevent the transmission of this virus. So the state is going to tell locals how they can, um, what they cannot do. At the same time, he's sending it down to the locals to figure out how to uh, send, do this vaccination. If he does, if he thinks Tallahassee knows best, then he owns the the terrible rollout of this vaccination program. And yes, he owns the surge because in as people go out um, and they think, well, the government's not saying I can't do this. Uh, they're not slapping my hand or finding me, and businesses are allowed to pack people in. Um, you know, he it's. It, 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 Nancy's right. It starts at the top it, in the lack of organization from the federal government and then at the state government. All we've heard from him is no. No, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. What we have yet to hear is what are you going to do to try to stop the spread of this deadly virus? Yeah. Well, for the record, let me just say we here on this program have tried for months to get Governor DeSantis to come on and certainly to get an answer to that question. He doesn't want to talk to us very much or uh, other people in the media. Rosemary and Nancy, hold on. Everybody stay in your place. We'll be back. More Roundtable in just a minute. Welcome back. We are in the midst of a really interesting roundtable with two old friends and two of the best journalists I know, Nancy Ancrum, the Miami Herald, Rosemary O'Hara of the Sun Sentinel. Uh, well, we, I think the political event uh, of the last year clearly was the election of Joe Biden uh, to be president, and he will be sworn in January 20th. But um, uh, Nancy, here on, um, uh, on Wednesday when Congress meets, You've got a group of maybe a dozen or so senators who are going to object to accepting the results of the Electoral College. Is this just for show? Because, you know, they're not going to win. Joe Biden is going to get 306 electoral votes. Donald Trump, 232. Biden is the winner no matter what the president says. Exactly, exactly. This is for show, but it is such a dangerous and perilous show. Uh, to the point where, I think, was it just today, maybe yesterday, there were Trump supporters outside of Marco Rubio's yes. house demanding, demanding that he join this group of anti-democracy renegades. Yes, this is for show. This is going to hold the process up, and it is going to end with Joe Biden being inaugurated on January 20th. But it is a great way to score points for, uh, for uh, 2022, for 2024. Uh, and I think we even see that happening here in Florida when we have, again, a governor who is um, continuing to pander to the people he will be counting on for support should he run for uh, president in 2024. Yeah. Well, Rosemary, as you well know, we have a whole group of people in Florida who are thinking about possibly running for president in 24. Marco Rubio, Rick Scott, uh, Governor DeSantis, Matt Gates. Good Lord, the list goes on and on. Uh, but, you know, the, the serious thing that Nancy raises about this, whatever they're going to do on Wednesday, is that it undermines the legitimacy of an election and it throws a monkey reach, a wrench into the peaceful transfer of power, which is a fundamental building block of American democracy. You know, it's a sad day for the grand old party it, um, that had a noble beginning in fighting slavery and today has become the party of Trump. It's Trump, it's, it's these um, members who are going to challenge the results you know, call themselves members of the party of Trump. And uh, it, is a, it is dangerous that for a peaceful um, turnover, and, but it also 
shows that we have got to do something about the electoral college, this antiquated system that doesn't let the popular vote win. And I understand that people in the rural areas don't want the people in the cities to, you know, uh, have more influence than they do. But it is, we should have one citizen, one vote for Americans. And if, if, I mean, I think the answer coming out of this is we have got to do something about the electoral college so that the, the, that the results of the voters cannot be thrown out and elections overturned as these renegade, anti-democracy, Republican, Trumpism yeah. lawmakers in Congress are seeking to do. Right. Uh, I want to move on because a lot of some, there were some things, some moments in 2020 that gave me real hope, made me feel good about the future of the country. One of them, frankly, even though I wasn't crazy about her as a presidential candidate, I really very excited that Kamala Harris uh, is the vice president uh, that she was chosen. I think in retrospect, it's been a very good choice. And uh, I think uh, Nancy having a, a black woman, an Asian woman, American woman, uh, as vice president of the United States, what a moment. I mean, this is- And exactly, and a heartbeat away, um, you know, from the presidency as all vice presidents are. Uh, Yes, and I think that the support she received, of course, from, you know, her sorority sisters writ large in terms of black women who came out to support her, but also she spoke uh, very, very uh, uh, movingly to, you know, uh, others who are part of her roots, including um, uh, Asian Asian communities in this country. It really is a groundbreaking and glass ceiling breaking turn of events right and uh even though it's not your county rosemary but i happen to you know think it's a great moment that daniela levine cava was elected as the mayor of miami day the first time a woman has been a mayor of this great county and she's i think doing a solid job so far well even up here across the great wall of uh, broward we were excited to see her win that election too because we know her to be, you know, a principled um, county leader. She's a, she's a voice on climate change, um, which, and transportation and regionalism. Yeah. Um, so, so I was excited to see her too. Yeah, Rosemary, I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to cut you and Nancy off. We are out of time. Love talking with you. Thank you for your time this morning. Happy New Year. Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year. Thanks so much, Mike. Okay, we'll be right back. Thanks for being with us today and throughout 2020. We couldn't do this program without you, and we couldn't do it also without an extraordinarily talented team. Want to take a minute to thank the people, help Glenna and me get the show on the air every week. Executive producers Lisa Hendry and Natalie Moreira, producer Vanessa Espinel, associate producer Joanna Hecker, directors the great Chris Haggerty, Ryan Anthony, Linda Castronovo, editors Myron Williams, and Lex Francis, engineering technicians Giselle Miranda, Robert Ravino, and our floor crew Dominic Williams and Gilberto Aguilar. We wish them and you a very happy new year, and as always, stay informed, get involved. Have a great Sunday.